My, you might have to close your door. Okay. Alright, so let me find. Hey, Delon, how are you? Where's my stream? What's up, bro? What's up, bro? Uh, how What's you going doing? On? I got to readjust and the way you look like, like, like I look like I've been hanging in D.C., which I've been hanging in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. It's so good to see y'all. What's up? Um, good to see you. How you doing, Torin, Mr. Cooper? I'm all right. Got two more weeks left, and we done. I know. Man, Mr. Really Cooper, man, we, we have a mutual friend, man, Joe. Yeah, Joe, yeah, yeah. Joe Wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my, that's my guy. I met him a couple years ago. Yeah, man, I grew up with him, man. And um, he was like, how you know my dude? I'm like, I haven't met him yet. I said, I know yeah. Catherine, though. And he gave me a rundown about, it, about you and everything, man. So I was looking forward to meeting you anyway. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, all right. I'm adding in Mr. Kobe. Say was unable to join, so let me see again. But yeah, so how y'all been? Okay, so today is Friday. Well, you know, Boom been out of. Well, I keep. I have to stop. I have to make sure I don't call you Boom. Now you call me Boom because you know, I mean, they call me Boom. I can't pay that I included my name for that purpose. So Boom is fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. Cool. Because I was like, I don't know what you all want me to call you. So let's get that up front. How you doing, Mr. Lewis? We Good. Have how are you? How y'all doing, guys? What's up, brother? Chilling on Friday night. Hey, Friday night. <laughs> night. We just finished school. I heard you guys talking. We just finished today with the students, so y'all know I'm late. <laughs> so, you're in lucky. Texas, right? Yes, I'm in Dallas. Nice, nice. My daughter's trying to get out there to Dallas. Oh, um, I've been to Dallas a long time ago, and it was something bird mall. Red Bird Mall. That was the hood mall. <laughs> <Red Bird. laughs> That's all I can remember. Well, um, for those who, well, Mr. Lewis don't know me, but um, I'm Catherine Lewis, and I am an educator in the D.C. area. Um, I've been doing this for like 16 years. Um, my brother, Boom, right there, uh, we began teaching a long time ago in like 2004, I think it was. That was three. 2003, 2003. Mm -hmm. yeah, 2003 in New Orleans, uh, yeah. and we go way back, and I had the pleasure of working with Mr. Cooper yes. um, for a Sigma function um, that they had a, a platform when they were talking about, um, I think it was virtual learning and helping your student um, gain knowledge in virtual learning, so this is going to be phenomenal because I admire all of you, and um, I want to thank you all for First of all, for being in this profession, because you all are needed. And it's so important to have black males, especially um, strong, um, intelligent um, black males that are role models for these students. And I know a lot of people say, oh, your mama or your daddy should be your role model. But these kids need to see beyond their experience at home. So I am just so excited to have this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Colby, for no accepting problem. my invitation, even though no I'm a stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking me. Yeah. I'm honored. All right, so I'm going to start from the top. So we have Mr. Cooper, so he can give a proper introduction of who he is and what he did. Yes, thank you, um, Catherine, for inviting me to come out and share. Um, my name is Torrin Cooper. I'm native Washingtonian, and I'm currently a first grade teacher um, in DCPS. And I got my start through a program called the Liederman Fellowship Program, um, which is a pipeline for recent high school graduates to go into the career of early childhood education. So that's how I got my start. 
um, at Turner, uh, where I work now, started a mentoring program for boys in grades three to five, um, became a mentor to boys who even graduated. Um, but I'm all about education, all about mentorship, and all about helping the community um, that I am a part of. Um, I heard before elders say that they have to see us to be us, and that's a motto and a mantra I live by, being in the classroom for the young brothers and young girls to see us so they know um, what they can be, what they can aspire to be and beyond. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Whoever want to go next at the back. <laughs> go ahead, okay. I am Kobe Lewis, I'm also known as Mr. Lou to you. I am from the great Dallas, Texas. I um, this is my, I have just finished my seventh year of teaching where I have taught fifth grade mathematics throughout my entire years of teaching. I've only taught sixth grade mathematics slightly, but um, majority of the time I've been with the same grade level, same content. How I got into teaching, I actually didn't expect to become a teacher. I think um, I know that I was called. God yeah. honestly called me. I, um, it definitely wasn't something that I looked forward to doing. I, I didn't look into because I already knew about the pay for teachers. So that definitely wasn't, you know, something that I was looking to get into. But I knew that this was a calling that God had upon me. And it was just um, me accepting the calling. And um, once I accepted the calling, I was working in my church, actually. And a lady asked me, did I want to work with the youth? And I was like, OK, cool, because I do mine. So that's how I initially started mommy with the guys in my church. And then I was like, okay, maybe I can go into this. I got my certification in education. And um, I knew that I wanted to be a different teacher compared to the teachers that I've normally seen or experienced. So um, that once I, I got my certification, I knew that I immediately want to go in and immediately want to make a change in, in our young people's lives. Awesome. All right. And Boomy. Last Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Catherine, for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity. My name is Winston Witten Jr. Um, everyone knows me as Boom, Boom Witten Jr. Um, I came into education by default. I didn't go to college traditionally like everybody else and go straight through four years. Um, after um, four years, I found myself at home, hadn't finished college. And I was working at Sears, actually. And I didn't like working at Sears. And I was, had opportunity to become a substitute teacher. And my first subbing job was at my old high school. And I saw that there was a need for black male teachers because all the strong black male teachers that I had in high school were no longer there. So once I set out that semester and enrolled back into college, I knew once I graduated, I was going to go into education. And that's why I've been for the last 20 plus years, um, it would take a few years because I did spend some time outside of education, but I find myself always coming back into education. Right now, I'm currently um, serving as a behavior support program manager at a, um, at a middle school in New Orleans. Um, at a KIPP school in New Orleans, actually. But I served I in um, education. Yes, I served in education under um, multiple capacities. I'm um, a science teacher of biology, chemistry, and physics. I've also worked trio programming, upper bound educational talent search. I've also um, volunteered my own personal time to um, give tutoring services to students and whatnot um, throughout the areas I live, be it Houston or New Orleans. So I find myself just engulfed in education in any aspect, in any area that's needed to help our young children and to be that um, example for our young our young men out here that's trying to find their way and navigate their way through life. And that's awesome. And I know, um, Torin, can I, can I call you Torin? Or yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> and I know you're in the public schools in D.C., right? Yes. Yeah, so it's a little different because I never taught at a kid's school, but I've heard stories about how y'all get a cell phone and they like basically trap you like the whole time. <laughs> I've heard these wild stories, but I don't know. But you know, it's a little bit more um, detailed than what we do, uh, Mr. Cooper. Like yeah. we go home. <laughs> I, I heard that you, they make y'all do all kind of roles. Like Boom said, he, he's the behavior specialist. I heard teach science. Probably a disciplinarian on, on uh, Thursdays and uh, Tuesdays. So. <laughs> But but that's awesome um, that you all are in that. Um, what isn't that a private or is it a charter? It's um it's a charter. It's a charter. As you know, in New Orleans, we're unique. 
we're the only city in the nation that has an all charter network. Our charter network consists of about um, 78 different schools ran by about 35 different charter networks. So it's a different beast down there. You know, um, I, I do work for Kip. I enjoy working for Kip. Um, it's not what I heard it was. Okay. Um, it's actually better. Um, we don't have the cell phone. I wish they did give me a cell phone. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good. It's a good program. I work for a good. Um, I work for a good principal and assistant principal, and they're really trying to change things as it relates to education and charter education in New Orleans. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be aboard with them. Awesome. So we heard about how you all got your start. So let's start with the grimy piece first, and then we'll let up it towards the end and talk about your successes. But um, what are some things that you all see inside the classroom? Because coming from the lens of a woman, I'm a mother. So a lot of times, the things that I see, I look at it in more of a nurturing thing. And it's not a lot of times that we hear about men being nurturers, right? It's always the black man, is the, 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 the disciplinarian or the, or the person who don't have these strong connections with people. You're not impersonal. Um, it's just do as I do. You know, I mean, do as I say. And, um, it's never really... Um, looking at you guys as nurturers. So let's talk about first, why do you think is not a lot of male educators in the classroom? So so I I um I think we kinda gotta work backwards a little bit and and to think about um there there's not a lot of black males in the classroom because there's not a lot of um, encouragement for black males to pursue this career. Um, this, because we kind of look at the ideal careers as lawyer, doctor, even like, you know, being a president and never anything that's communal, like a teacher, um, that's not really glorified. So you see on social media, you see in the news or whatever, these black men who have money, they're in music, they're in sports. And um, it's not really somebody that you see every day that, ha <clears throat> that has the things that you want. And it wasn't until I got into education where I met principals, teachers who were making six figures, living good lives, good cars, good homes. I'm like, Dad, like, this is what you do? And you're a teacher? You're a principal? All right, this is the type of career that I want on this financial side. But I think also we have to push um, other our, our, our brothers, you know, who are, you know, good men to be in the classroom. All right, well, you, I know you have kids. I know you have this experience how about you consider, you know, being in the classroom, sharing this, maybe even part time. And I think that's something that we just have to say, like we have a need and if we're not making it something that men want to come to making it attractive, then we won't have um, brothers in the program, brothers in the class. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a society to where it's, it's all about your arrival, the American dream. The American dream is a good job. A good job is anything that pays the bills and you're allowed to be able to vacation and have the luxuries and stuff that you want. I, I really came into this not looking to make a career and make a financial career out of it, but I actually want to just make a change. So I understood that I may not get paid what I think I want to get paid and I may not get paid what the cost of living is in the city that I'm living in, but I just do this to make a change. So I also believe that if I'm doing something for the right, that the high entity that I believe in will sustain me. So money is not my motivator. My motivator was knowing that in a city where I'm from, New Orleans, that the unemployment has been around 52% for the last 25 years for black males. My motivation is that the incarceration of the black males in Orleans and Louisiana and Angola is sky high. So my motivation is to give back to change that narrative. You know, regardless of what it's gonna pay me, and regardless of um the status it's gonna give me. I really want to affect change and I want to send a message to black youth that it's cool to be educated. It's cool to have something in your mind. It's cool to be something other than 
what you see dangled in front of you. You know, it's all it's all fine and dandy to be an entertainer and want to be a rapper, a singer, and want to be a superstar. However, I really believe if we want to move ourselves out of poverty, out of oppression as a people, we need to educate ourselves. And if I can play a part in doing that, that's what I'm going to do. So I chose to do that for that reason and that reason alone. I knew I wasn't going to ever be making a million dollars, you know. But the smile on a young person's face when they say, thank you, Mr. Witten, when they say I'm doing this because of you, when I see my adult students now say I majored in science because you're a science major, Mr. Witten, and I appreciate you um, through high school because your class is like my college classes, that's worth more than any monetary salary anybody could pay you know, so that's why I do it. Um, um, just the reason that I feel that there are not enough men in education because um, men are known to be the providers. Mm -hmm. And we want fast money, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to provide. And where's the fast money? It's in rapping, it's in sports, it's in selling drugs. So immediately men normally go to the fast money in education you have to work you you have to do some work and and, and like like um, my brother just said you have to do some work and maybe not get paid what you're deserving so with that stereotype and everybody knowing um i had a student the other day said mr lewis you almost work for free why you work here i said for you so you don't have to work for free in the future That's you know so Things like that and them seeing that, uh, uh, another male, a strong male, does sometimes motivate our youth because now there's, um, with them seeing strong males in there, they know like, okay, I don't just have to be a football player. I can actually be educated. And it's a lot of smart guys that lead to sports because they feel like, okay, you know what, this is the best way. This is the best route. When in our actuality, they probably could be the, you know, best at another career. Right. So, what I, I feel a lot of them just want the easy money and the easy money is those other um, careers that does provide that where you have to do less work to make more money. Yeah. And um, one of my coworkers, um, Dee, she just said that education has never been like a sexy choice. Right. Um, well, it's like nursing. Right. Um, it's not a lot of male nurses. Right. Um, right. Because that's not looked at as a masculine position. And I think that's another social norm um, that we need to get rid of, right? We need to dispel that myth that male teachers are masculine. <laughs> you know, male teachers are um, have the ability to go, just like you said, uh, Kobe, to go into the classroom and make money, right? Because we can dispel some myths here. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have to be an administrator in the DMV area to make $100,000 inside the classroom. Mm -hmm. Easily you do your 15 years and you are at the cusp or maybe 13 to, you know what I mean? You can reach that, that number. So, you know, that's enough. Um, even if you have a partner or without a partner, um, you can live um, very well off of $100,000. You know, Kobe and I know we're the math teachers here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. you know? But, um, uh, yeah, so let's dispel that myth that teachers are poor and we're broke. Right. <laughs> so, um, fellas or any uh, guys that's looking to maybe make a career change, because that would be great. You know, I would really like for people to start looking at that. Um, the first thing is they do make money um, and you can make a lot of money. Um, I know one of my coworkers, when he retired, um, he was making approximately $130,000 as a classroom teacher accounting and he did his 25 years and, and he you know is living a great life and retired um so you up here the possibilities are endless and you know in education we could do multiple things and get stipends you get more money right. on top of that and you can funnel yeah. into administration if you like so not making money we're not broke and uh, fellas that's in this, uh, we know that it's a lot of money up here. That's why I'm trying to get more money. It's a whole lot of money. <laughs> yeah, no, I need to do up there. But also, you need to understand, to get... need to understand that you don't have to just be a classroom teacher to be in education. Yeah. Yeah. There are so many avenues to education. That's why I love that work for trio programming. Because I thought that that type of program was really integral and important because it, it instructed and taught students how to be a student. 
You know, like you're taught how to be a quarterback, how to be a cheerleader. You have to know how to be a student. You know, before you can get to like the the the, the, the meat and the potatoes of reading and writing arithmetic, you have to know how to organize your time, how to develop good study good study habits, how to um be receptive to things that's being assimilated towards you. You know, it's a skill set to know how to pay attention. A lot of our kids don't have that skill set. So I love instilling the skill sets within students to help them and aid them in their academic journeys. You know, so there's multiple aspects to education. You don't have to just be in a classroom, but you can be integral in a child's life by just being there and showing them the skill of being a student. You know, it is an art to being a student. A lot of people don't realize that. And if we, if, if we was to um, instill that in our students and let them know, it'll make their journey that much easier because they, they, they feel swamped sometimes. It's like, this is too much. But if you understood, there's a way to be a student. This is the steps to being a student. Organizing your time, organizing your space, and things, things of that nature. So when you talk about education, we don't just have to be nine to five in a classroom teaching math. You could have a wide range of things that you could do within education. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So what, let's talk about parents. Um, and let's get into uh, parenting before I talk about management. Because mm. I have been being in special ed for over 15 years. Um, I finally got off the plantation. That's what I say. <laughs> um, I'm, not, right. I'm, still, I'm still staying. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm finally out of there. I escaped. But um, after 15 years, I think I should have only did 10, but that's <laughs> right, the show. Um, parents can be difficult. And we all work in predominantly uh, black areas um, where our school districts are. So, how do you all deal with the lack of parenting and the helicopter parent. So how do you deal with <laughs> the you helicopter parent? That's a new term to me. Elaborate on that before I, before somebody answers. What's the helicopter parent? Oh, they're always emailing you. They want to know how the ninety eight can get to a hundred, you know, that oh, yeah. I don't have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that experience too actually. Yes, yes. Yes. You know, and Tori, why don't you go? Because you're coming from a uh, elementary uh, standpoint, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you gotta. I think there is a way to be understanding and also firm too. So this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm not going to do respectfully. And this is my classroom. I'm coming to your house and teach you and show you how to run your house. Don't come to my classroom doing the same thing. And I think once you start from the beginning having that conversation with the parent about how your classroom is run, take suggestions, you know, and work that into it, then they'll be more prone to respect what you have going on. Um, the helicopter parents, you give them what you can't. Hey, the teachers are super busy. I promise. In this past year online, teachers are booked, like book, book. And I'm going to give you what I can do. My assistant, they're going to do what they can do, but don't press this out because you're going to get ignored. And then we're going to send you right to admin and take that up to them. You know, um, for the parents who are not that um, engaged, um, it always takes like um, a call or a text, hey, thinking about you and the family, how's everything going? You know, is everything okay? That kind of thing, you know, periodically. And that's something that our school established this year. Um, every Thursday and Friday uh, was our check-in day. So um, in the evening time, we didn't have planning, but those were our time to kind of build relationships with families. So that even if it's a parent that didn't even like you, you're still getting communication from me to say, this is what's going on in the classroom. This is what I need you to know. And this is what I need you to do for the student. Um, but when I first started in the classroom, all my mentor teachers were telling me, Coop, you got to be firm. Don't let the kids run the classroom. Don't let the teachers run the classroom. Know what you believe. Know how you want to run your classroom and stick to it. Lean on your team for support. Lean on the admin for support. And if there's any time you feel harassed, if you will, um, <laughs> uncomfortable, forward that right up the ladder to the admin, and then they're supposed to take care of that and work that out um, whenever way they can. Okay. Nice. You got sound like you got a supportive team over there. That's good. Okay, That's for sure. Because sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing like being at a school and, and nobody supports you, not even yeah. at. 
You, that, you that's, know that's that. the worst. You're right. <laughs> that's the worst. All right. Uh, I mean, parental involvement is always a challenge um, at any school. You have the helicopter parent. Thanks for your time. But where I'm from, we have the uninvolved parents for whatever reason that may be. I never place the blame on the parent on why they're not involved. You never know what's happening in their lives. We have a lot of um, single parent households. We have a lot of single parent households with that parent being the sole breadwinner. So they may not be able to be involved. When I look at the involvement of parents in education, that's an onion. And once you peel back those layers, there's so many factors why a parent may or may not be involved in their child's educational lives. So I don't I don't put emphasis on the parent not being involved or involved. But I try my best to reach out to the parents and let them know what they need to be doing or what they should be doing and how they can assist me get their child to where they need to be. Right. I find opportunities um, within the school day. Say, for instance, um, right now, um, it's a lot of um, parents that come in to pick their children up after school. That's my time to be active. See, my phone calls after school, I may not get a phone call on um, my answer. But if you're picking your child up, I can walk through your car door and I can have a conference right there with you, you know? So I'm always hands-on with my parents. I like, I like to see parents come pick their child up because maybe it's the opportunity where, hey, I've been calling you all week and you've been at work. As you're here now, let me give you a rundown of what's going on with your son. Your son is a phenomenal student. He needs X, Y, and Z, you know? Or your son who's struggling with X, Y, and Z. This is what we need to work on. How can we get from point A to point B? If your hands are tied, I understand that. If you're available, this is what you should be doing or could be doing, you know? I never look at the parent to do my job because I'm the educator. However, there are some things that they can do to prepare their child for school. And that's the only thing I expect from a parent, to have their child prepared for the information that I'm going to assimilate towards them. If they can do that, then I can do my job. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't fault parents for not being in their child's life academically, especially when I'm servicing um, an impoverished um, group of kids. We have kids that come from backgrounds of social economic dysfunction. So you can't expect so much from home when you already know where that child comes from. What I can do at that point is identify where that child is, where that child is and take it where it needs to be. If he has someone in his life that can be a part of this journey, then I will include them. If not, I will be that person. Once those parents see that you wholeheartedly care about their child, That's they're right. going to naturally gravitate and come and participate in whatever it is and do their part. If it's just being, hey, Mr. Whitten, I made sure my son had breakfast this morning. Thank you, Ms. Smith. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. I don't need him to be hungry this morning because we're about to take leap tests or tax tests, whatever it is. So just do that little small thing I need from you and I can do my job. Um, that's the conversation that has been back and forth. We have educators that blame parents. We have parents that blame educators. We have people in the community that blame parents. We never knew what those parents were going through because then it gets to the systemic issues that affect us in society as black people. And a lot of those factors have a, a huge role in our parents being absent in our children's lives. Oh, that's deep. That's a good one. Because some people may say, oh, well, you're not holding the parents accountable for the child. Um, but I remember hearing a guy say a long time ago, when you get the kid, cook the kid from 8 to 3.30, right? And you uh, have to make sure that you build that relationship and you hook that kid so that you can with you. Forget what's going on with the mom was not doing not being, uh, present. Um, but a lot of, I think a lot of uh, times we have teachers that are not culturally sensitive to our black kids. So what happens is that they make the assumption that um, the parents are there or what they should and should not be doing. And um, it becomes, um, how would I say, it would not, it would, it would be a catalyst to right yep. because yep. we can hold the kid accountable for the parents too so we want to make sure 
And that was awesome what you said, boom. It's like running to the car and making sure that you can connect with the parent right there and there. Um, and I know as a sped teacher, we need to find every little possibility, every opportunity um, to hook with the parent, even if the kid about to get suspended. Oh, mama coming? Oh, let me let me hurry up and run and talk to her while she's walking down the hall. <laughs> it has been yep. done before. Um, so that's a great thing. But Kobe, what is it that you need from parents? Because a lot of times I'm looking, I'm always amazed looking at your Instagram feed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have rap songs, you have different things that you're doing inside the classroom. And because you're um, such a phenomenon, like on social media, you've been on the news um, with, with the things that you're doing for engagement. Um, what are some things that you need from parents when you are cycling that type of uh, uh, pedagogy out of your classroom? Um, one thing, well, the main thing that I need from parents is to um, be transparent with me. Um, one thing that I do, as the other guys stated, they, they talk to the parents at the beginning of the school year. Before I even meet the student, I talk to the parents. Mm -hmm. You know, and I try to build that relationship and let them understand that I'm not in this by myself. We're a team. <laughs> We're going to work together, you know, to get the success of your students. But I, I definitely need the parents to be transparent. If there's things going on, I don't need to know the details. But, you know, if it's anything that's going to be effective in that child's academic um, and their education, that's something that, you know, I possibly need to know. I try to make sure the parents know I'm not above them. Yeah. I'm the hood like you. Yeah. Just like you. So sometimes I have to talk to the parent like, hey, bro. Sometimes yeah. I have to take that down, you know, so it, I have yeah. to make sure that I meet that parent where they at so I can let them know, like, look, feel comfortable in me. I got your child. You don't have to worry about it. But let me know what's something I can do to make sure that I, I successfully have your child. Mm -hmm. So I've had parents that have, have definitely opened up to me about some things that I was able to assist or maybe help that student a little bit better because of that transparency with that parent. Um, there are some parents that feel comfortable calling me before calling the school, before calling. There are some yeah. parents that call me to That's discipline right. them in their own house. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah. Look, okay, she, I'm going to call Mr. Lewis. Or, okay. You know, <laughs> but that just shows that you're doing something right because you're building that relationship between the parent and the student. And I try to make sure that I do that within the classroom. I try to. If they talking about Fortnite, I may not know what Fortnite is, but I'm jumping in on the conversation and act like it right. just because I know yeah. that that's something that interests them. So I try to interest the parents and try to build interest with the students as well. For sure, brother. You, you said something important. Like, they want to know that you are like them. Like, you're relatable. You're not above them. And once they know, oh, you came from the same place. Oh, our parents mm -hmm. were the same high school kind of thing. Like, you build that relationship. They're more prone to be, I would say, like on your side, more willing to open up mm -hmm. and shit what's going on with you. And then you become mm -hmm. a part of their family, you know? And then it's not just, this is the teacher. No, we're together. Like, I'm this, mm -hmm. this is my role, this is their role. And you become whatever that student needs in their life and whatever that parent needs you to be. Um, and then that's why you can get those calls and say, hey, Mr. Cooper, such and such, like, can you help me help me out with this? Like, the school is saying this, but do you know how to do this? Mm -hmm. And then even on the weekends, outside of just education, what other resources do you have to connect me with food, to clothes, to education, to scholarships? You become that catalyst, you know, for changing that person's life because you showed yourself to be friendly. You showed yourself to be just like them, you know, and same, we all trying to get it get it like for real like anybody made it you know mm -hmm. i'm like you trying to do all that we can do to help one another out and i think community is important once they see that in you and they see that in the black male you know they're more prone to open up and then lean on you for help or whatever they need and, and for me i think that community is important um even though um i taught the academy she's like come out here and you can teach you can make a difference i believe i i can and i know i can but to move back to new orleans and teach in my hometown it gives me such a benefit. For one, I've been doing this so long to where as I, I've have I've had students that have been their parents have been my students. So that's the connection. But yeah. when you taught your community and they're coming in as parents and they see a familiar face, that makes a difference. You know, it was um it was an incident two years ago when I first moved back home at the school I was teaching at, a young lady who was having trouble contacting the young lady's parents, right? 
Well, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking at the young lady's um, credentials and uh, phone numbers and whatnot. And I'm like, this name sounds familiar. Guess what happened? This young lady, this student was my cousin and she didn't know. But I recognized her mother's name. So when I made the phone call, I made the phone call. I'm like, yes, this is Mr. Whitney called him such such high school. And she's like, who? I'm like, this is Boom Boom, your cousin. The people have been trying to get in contact with you. You know, so having those special connections like that. And not only having connections because people may be your relatives, but I'm from LJS. I teach in LJS. There's not too many people in LJS that I do not know. So when you when they understand that you're from where they're from, That's like right. you said, you're not above them, it makes all of a difference. You know? So when that parent comes in, they're like, oh, Mr. Whitten called Mr. Whitten called me, and I walk down and say, like, man, that's boom. Yeah, this is boom. That's why yeah. I said, there's no, there's no problem with you calling me boom right now, because I want the community to know that, yes, Mr. Whitten is boom, and Mr. Mr. Boom is Mr. Whitten, but he's a part of that community. So once they see that, it's like, okay, we have somebody up here that's from the community for the community. <laughs> you know? That makes a difference. In New Orleans right now, we have such an influx of people from out of town that can't make that connection. Not make the connection in the community, but not not they don't make the connection because they came from New York and you're in New Orleans. That's two different cities. It's a cultural shock for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So you had a disadvantage already. You don't look like us, you're not community, and you're not from here. That's right. So why don't have people that look like you from here to teach people that's living right there? Mm -hmm. That's the connection. I think that any school district needs to be heavy, heavy with a faculty and staff of people that's from that area. Now, I'm not saying if I'm from New York or New Jersey or, or California, I can't be a teacher here. But we need to have that cultural connection. We need to have that community connection. And when that person from California comes in, they're just bringing in a different aspect of their culture, of the black culture, to us now. Because we are related in some type of way. But that cultural connection and being from the area, the immediate area, is needed. Because if I was to look at you like a duck, you're just a duck if you're not from the... Right. You know? But if they know, oh... Yeah, we say that. Oh. That's, <laughs> that's Mr. Whitten. And Mr. Whitten is out there for Mardi Gras on the block partying. But Mr. Whitten is in the classroom as a professional, too. It's many yeah. conversations that I had on the parade route. Oh, I've been calling you all semester, man. Right now, put your back right now. Let's talk about your son. Back. And that's it. God is the God truth. I stopped from having fun to engage with my parents. And yeah. once they see, oh, he's taking time to engage with me right now, when you don't have to, that's when you bring parents in. Yeah. That's when they so that's when they, they they bought into it. That's the buy-in right there. When you step outside of your comfort zone, I could have walked past. How you doing, Ms. Johnson? And go down the block and finish it with my dad for you. No, I'm going to stop right now because I've been trying to talk to you for two weeks. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I do it. I try to, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. I'm not, a, like you said, dude, I'm not above you or beneath you. Mm -hmm. We're doing this together. The children are our future. So I'm trying to help bring them into what they need to know. And that's something that I can't do. And a lot of women might say, oh, you know, with the, with the feminist movement, I'm not. Here, listen. My thing is, the things that you all do inside the classroom, I can never do, right? Um, the connections that you make, even though I make you know, very good connections, through a black man teaching inside of a classroom, you all make connections in a type of way that um, a lot of black women or white people or whatever race you are, you will always have the the better um, um you know version of that because we can't do what you do right and I, I have to say you know, I have colleagues that's right next door that have these black men that have these phenomenal connections these people. and um I just like to observe and sit around but I can never imitate that because yeah. you all do something that nobody else can do. So I just want to commend you. Um, but let's switch gears a little bit. So let's talk about does teaching help you in the woman area when you're trying to find a mate? <laughs> like, but like, what are you, are you looking for another teacher? Are you looking for mm -hmm. a woman that's equally yoked or educated? Are you okay with having a woman that is not the what are you guys, male teachers, looking for in a woman 
right? That, uh, that's always, always, you know, was curious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, let's I, let Torrin go first. Well, no, no, no. Go ahead, Mr. Kobe. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, personally, definitely a woman that is nurturing and understanding and know that our workload goes beyond the classroom. You know, um, but also someone that understands that we are fathers outside of being fathers. Mm -hmm. You know, so there may be times where we have to communicate with another woman and how to build that relationship with the woman just to interact with her kid. Um, so uh, under, a woman that's understanding, that knows that, like, look, it's our job. We, we, now, there have been a lot of parents like, yeah, I need to hook you up with my, my sister or, <laughs> Ooh, even the kids try to hook you up. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Mr. Boy, or if they see you interacting with another teacher. Me personally, yep. I don't want another teacher. I don't want us to come home and talk. Oh, if that's just what, you know, both of us having to have the career of teaching, but I don't go seeking teachers, especially at work, because kids already put you with somebody. When no, you walk see. in, oh, you talking to me such such? Oh, yeah, I see y'all, you know what I'm you wear many hats, and they had the, that those hats do go outside of the um, classroom, and it may come home in time. Mm. Okay. So a woman that's not, um, I see D said territorial. Yes. Jealous. Jealous woman. Okay. <laughs> and a woman that yeah. understands that you're bringing your work home, because as an educator, you are bringing your work home. If I'm talking to, to, to George Mama at, Nine o'clock, I'm talking to her about George. I promise you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's about George. She, George. she just happened to get home late or something, but it's about George. I promise you. You know, honestly. Yeah, but not even jealous about other women, but jealous about kids. Mm -hmm. Like, Jordy, you want to go out? I'm like, okay, well, this Saturday, I'm taking the kids to this. Oh, you, you got kids? No, it's kids from the school, and they, they always be with me. So, are you cool with coming out with the kids? Like, no, you need to make time for me. Like, you always with them kids. I'm like, all right, I got you. Like, I promise you. And like the brother said, we don't want to talk about, you know, school, you know, when we get home, we talk about something else. Um, but let me, uh, so I'm, I'm new to the game. Like, I'm only two years in. I'm teaching, but I was in the classroom two years prior to that. And the brothers put me on game. They say, Coop, you here to teach. The women are going to come. The teachers don't. Not at school. Like mm -hmm. anybody coming to this building, off limits. And I, would, I had people approach me, like parents, like Facetime me during class because they had my number. I'm like, hey, this is a y'all got chill. Like it was crazy. And I was like, I've I've never had this much attention. But because <laughs> black men are so rare in the school building, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I got me a good man. I'm <laughs> I'm out. I'm going for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Like, but it was crazy. I had to get out of control. Like. Like he said, like kids are like busy, like nosy. Oh, I saw you at such and such classroom, or I know they brought you to this. Like, what's going on? I'm like, chill. Like, you in kindergarten? Like, how you even know what's going on? <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> but for me, anything like um, whatever a woman has, like that's her business. The only thing I'm looking for is someone who has the same heart for community. Like, that's it. Like, if you can match that, like that's one thing I'm looking for. The same drive for your people. Um, not even in teaching, it could be something else, but understanding that work goes beyond just 8 to 3.30, you know, and, and, and there's just like boundaries you set too, but understanding that my life is a service to people. Um, I'm not a slave to people, but a service to and with people. And if you can get that, like, we match, we match. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. I, I knew she was gonna put me on the spot. Real <laughs> question like that, for real. But um, I've historically not dealt with um other educators, and if it has, it hasn't been anyone that I've worked like closely with. Um, um, the person that I'm um intertwined with now is an educator, and it's crazy because we'll get off work, and our conversation will be about education and work until midnight. You know, and it's kind of good and a bad thing. It's good. It's good because the stuff we have to get off our chest. It's bad because, damn, maybe we're still talking about school and talking about work, you know. But um, as it relates to being a black male in education, um, I think women really respect that, especially when you let them know why you're doing it. 
That's right. You know, if you're really trying to affect change, you're trying to um, touch the lives of black men. If she doesn't respect that, I, I I question who she is. You know, because if you're trying to make a difference in someone's lives, and you can have someone that understands that that's your mission, mm -hmm. I think that that's a good thing because. In the long run, they can see that you can be a nurturing person. If you have a future with them, they understand, hey, he's good with kids. So he should be good with our kids or my kids, whatever the situation may be, you know. But um, I try to stay away from um, meeting my mothers and moms, you know. But sometimes it's hard because you go to the floor of the phone call service and they come walk to them like, oh, it snaps. Damn, Jonathan, that's, that's your mom. You know, it's just mama that you too. Yeah. You know, it's it's it, it, it is what it is. You know, um, have I been approached? Absolutely. Have I been seen outside of the classroom in in the spot somewhere having a drink or cigar, and the mother roll up on you like, "Hey, I'm Jonathan, Mama. Hey, stay over that end." You know, <laughs> but um, I think that um, being a male educator. I use that to my advantage because it, it, it shows that you do care for children, you know, and um, I think a lot of women look for that, especially in these, um, in these days and times where it's nine times out of ten, you're going to meet a female that already has children. And she wants to know that if she introduces you to her child, that her child is going to be safe and her child is going to be respected and taken care of. And she doesn't have to worry about that. There's too many times where um, um, the males are predators. So um, if I can show and prove that I'm a carer, I'm a nurturer, and um, I would do right by children, I think that any guy that's a um, professional teacher in education, they can use that to their advantage, not in a um, sneaky or slick way, but just to, that's an opportunity to, for them to show that this is who I am and this is how I will be for all children, not just your children, but all children. So it is a plus and a minus, depending on how bad yeah. it is. But don't feel bad because one of my coworkers, and he's still married to her. I think they've been married for probably like nine years now. That's how he met his wife. Uh, <laughs> it was his student's mom, <laughs> you know. So, so uh, we were all in the hallway one time, and uh, the kid walked by, the little girl walked by, and she was like, "Hey, daddy." And I was like, what the? Like, uh, I'm calling you daddy. And he was like, oh, oh you know, I'm, um, I, I've been a <laughs> You know, uh, one of your uh, frat brothers, uh, boom. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it could be a good thing. And then it could be a bad <laughs> thing. But, yeah, I, I guess uh, dating um, and Women, and that's a good point you brought up, Boom, because we do, women that have children, we do look for men that can be great fathers. And why not date a teacher? Because y'all already fathers inside the classroom. Exactly. You know, and y'all are trained nurturers. You know what right. I mean? So it's a big difference uh, between right. mm -hmm. someone who's trained and someone who always looks for great results. Oh, yeah, most definitely. So yeah. all three of y'all are great catches, you know, even if you're in a relationship or you're not in a relationship. So just know that the mamas are looking. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and the cousins sure. and the aunties. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. All right, but let's kind of switch to, let's pivot to, because I know Mr. Cooper has been in the game for two years. Yeah. So give some advice to Mr. Cooper. Think about oh. when you were two years in the game. All right. Um, oh, God. And um, think about what you wish someone would have told you. And let's tell it to Mr. Cooper. And I'm going to start off first, Mr. Cooper. Um, I've had bad advice um, throughout my history of teaching. And one thing that was horrible was um, never put a kid out. And... Um, your classroom management should match that book, Harry Wong book. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's the name of that book? Um, the day, the first days of school. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to tailor my classroom management to something that was written in a book. And I struggled with my classroom management um, with black kids. Um, 
And I failed many times because I was reading from a book from a white author who mm. had no experience dealing with black kids and classroom management with black kids. So um, I listened to all the professional developments, but all the PDs came from white people. Yeah. And that's where I went wrong. So um, don't read material from people or teachers or educators that are not black, <laughs> that cannot give you the information that you need about your black kids that you service, mm. right? Um, inside of the classroom. So that was my failed uh, classroom management approach. I listened to the wrong people and that's good for like relationships. So that's how I failed in, and I had to learn. It took me about five years though. Five, six years before I could get classroom management to a point where I didn't need admin support anymore. I didn't need to kick a kid out, right? So that took me about five years <laughs> before I got to that point. My word of advice, and I'm just learning that this year. I'm learning that this summer. This is my first time in my 20-plus year career not working summer school or summer program. Manage and take control of your mental health and your mental well-being on your personal side. Um, if you don't have days that's going to roll over next year, take all your days. I've always wanted to be there for my students because I felt that I needed to be there. I owe that to them. But I took for granted that I need that personal time away for my mental health. You know, So take your mental health days, take advantage of whatever... Um, um, services that your school network provides as it relates to therapeutic services um, to relax and step away from that classroom. We try to make such a big old change in, the, in these children's lives, but we forget about ourselves. And we're not mentally there and physically there for our children, then we can't be that change. So take care of yourself. Put yourself first sometime. You know, I had to learn at the hallway and this is my first year since 2003 not working the summer. And I'm enjoying myself right now because I needed that mental break. So take that mental break. Dude. Don't do like me and just hit it, hit it, hit it. Take a mental break because if you break down, you can't be that for those students. And yes, we sir. need you. Man, y'all have said some things that I've taken in myself, honestly. Um, but if I could give you one advice that I had to learn was don't be afraid to teach from your heart. Meaning that if you know in your heart that something's gonna work for your kids, um, there may be some pushback from your principals. There may be some pushback from administration, but if you know what you know, and you know this will be um, beneficial towards your students, teach for your students, not for admin or anything else because there are some admins that never had the experience of the students that you have you know so don't be afraid to teach from your heart i had to learn like i do have a voice as an as a teacher i can stand up for my students because who else are going to stand up for them if that teacher is not standing up for them you know so don't be afraid to use your voice there's a respectful way that you can come at your administrations and give them you know propositions this is the situation and this is how I feel it should be handled. And I know, you know, it, it can be handled. So don't be afraid to teach from your heart and show them that you know that you know, you know, and, and fight for your kids. Because I I fought several times for my kids for things that they say you wasn't supposed to do. And then I get them scores and they're like, oh, Mr. Lewis. So you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's do what you know you know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? For and, sure. And it'll all work out. And, 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 and don't like to piggyback on what he said. Don't be afraid. I've been dismissed from positions in schools for speaking my mind. But um, I know that if I'm, if I'm standing for the right thing, I'll be okay. I've always landed somewhere better. I've never been afraid to stand up for my kids and speak, you know. And Catherine, no. You know, my first thing, our first job, JPMI, had to say something, you know. And um, administrators are not going to like that all times. But if you stand up for those kids and stand up for yourself in the right thing, in the morally right thing, God is going to have you. Don't worry about that job. Another is going to roll around. Believe you me. And I'm no T.D. Jakes. 
I'm no, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not no always in church every Sunday. I have faith and I know if I'm doing the right thing, yeah. it will be okay. And I've always landed in the right spot, yeah. you know. So just stand up for your kids. And when you know they're being messed over by the system, say something. That's say right. something. Say something. Oh, I'm a good emailer. I'm a good anonymous emailer too. Oh, and I'm a good type type out the the law, the infraction that they're doing, and put it mm -hmm. in their mailbox anonymous. Yeah. I'm the one that's gonna let you what, know I'm that my state gave me not receiving that services because the such and such uh, denied services for this kid. And don't be afraid. And I totally agree with Boom because we were in it together. I remember one time, Boom. You remember the administrator told you to cut your dreads off. Yep. Yep. I remember yep. that. He was yep. teaching in, was that in Houston? That was in Houston. Yeah, because was in Houston. teaching in, in, in New Orleans initially, Hurricane Katrina came. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then um, we went to, we all did, were displaced and went to Houston. And yep. I got a job at this school. And Did she I call called me? Them home. I'm like, yo, <laughs> you know, we need you over here. I'm going to hook yep. you up. I got a little hookup. But I never forget that person when they told you that. Um, so, yeah, and- And I still have them. I still yeah. have them. I ain't cutting nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I got them. And but that person, was, was that a, um, a black man or was it a white man? I forget. Well, it was, the, the, a black administrator told me, but it came from the white mm. administrator. They didn't want to tell me themselves. Oh, so wow. they came and they had a conversation. The conversation yeah. was, so, um, <laughs> What's your religion? What do you think about your hair? And does your hair think it's your religion? And it was like all over the place. I'm like, what's the question? Mm -hmm. what? You just cut your hair. I'm like, it's not going to happen. You know, I mean, what does my hair have to do with me teaching a child? You know? So um, it's crazy because you would think that only um, black women experience that with their natural hair and the natural hair movement for the last 15 years. But I've been asked to cut my hair several times and I have refused to cut my hair because my hair doesn't define me, but um, my hair does make a statement I want to make. It's it's me. It's what I want. It's what I want to be. So I should have to change myself to educate your child because I'm trying to educate your child to be um, a strong believer of, of themselves. So if their belief in themselves is being um, outgoing, outspoken, I'm going to encourage them to be that. If they want to express themselves through their hair, through their culture in their hair, I'm going to allow them to do that because people think that education is just that discipline, math, English, reading in a book. No, education is getting to know who you are, that KOS, that knowledge of self. So I'm here to teach black boys how to be a black man and understand who they are and who they are. You know, yeah. once they understand that, the sky's the limit. That's the problem. Nobody wants to stand up give a black child their identity. Once you have your identity, you can take that identity and run with it. You know, so be who you are. Be a strong black individual. Be outspoken. Yes, be right. um, and be civilly disobedient at times. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, and that's true, Torin. Listen. We have been many places, and I and listen. I think I'm, I'm the no boom is a veteran. I think you like, I mean, what you about 20 years almost? Yeah, I'm, I got you about a few years. That's <laughs> all it is. You're up there with me too, you yeah. know. <laughs> and we have created a ruckus. Um, somebody asked boom though, did you get fired from that job? I don't remember. And I'm not gonna disclose. Um, did I get fired? No, I didn't get fired. What happened was that network they lost their charter in Houston. You know, and that's how Captain ended up up here, you know. But um I didn't get fired I didn't get fired from that job. I stood firm on what I believed in and I gave my rationale on why and they respected that, you know. So I'm not sure what she reported back to her administrator, but I told her exactly what I felt and I was fine. Yeah, you gotta make sure that you stand firm. Yes. And because there's gonna be times touring where you're gonna think about your car note and your yeah. brand. <laughs> And then you're going to think about, should I protect this kid? Mm -hmm. And you know what I have learned? Protecting that child. Because I can't go to sleep at night knowing that I could have done something. And right. I'm just selfishly thinking about myself, right? Mm -hmm. So there are going to be challenging times for you. But always stand firm in what you believe in. And go for what's right. And always go for um, what's 
needs to be justified. Um, yeah. Somebody once told me, like, do you want to be right or do you want justice? You know, <laughs> you know, because sometimes you can't get both. But I found that when you're doing the work for these children and you are going behind the scenes, whatever you're doing, right, and you are making a difference, the jobs are going to come. If they fire you, you have that paperwork, you have your credentials and accoutrements, you are going to go somewhere else. And just like yeah. said, your launching pad will be maybe DCPS, but who knows where you will land, mm -hmm. right? So you have to believe in yourself and know that because y'all are needed, y'all can get a job anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, uh, Mr. Kobe, I'm sorry, we've been talking and, and I know you've been quiet over it. No, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. anything uh, resonating with you, Mr. Cooper, that you think? Um, um, a lot of self-care, of course. A lot of speaking up for children. Um, and like Brother Boom said about that identity, like that is definitely important. We are teaching them, you know, academics, but we're also teaching them about themselves. Um, and in DCPS, we have this thing called social, emotional, academic development, understanding that academics are inextricably tied to your social, emotional wellness, right? And as Black men, talking about getting more Black women in the classroom, if Black boys see Black men in the classroom, they have something to aspire to be, right? So when they get to elementary school, middle school, high school, I had a black male teacher who taught me this, who made me feel like this, and this is the same thing that I want to do for mm -hmm. black students too. So just being myself authentically, standing on what I believe in, standing up for children, um, standing up for myself and caring for myself, taking those breaks when I need to, uh, and not being afraid to, to kind of go against the grain, right? If you're calling me to do this job, have faith in me to do this job. And it may not look like what's in the book all the time, you know, but go with what you know and what you have um, experience in. Um, my first teacher I was in the classroom with as a co-teacher, um, she was she was big on that. Like, we go to all these PDs, going to all of these seminars and books and stuff with these people that don't look like us, they don't know us. You know, we take that from scholars, researchers or whatever, but this is what we do in our classroom because our children mm -hmm. need this. And that takes, you know, some time to understand each child. And each classroom is different. Every year it changes, you know. But um, being rooted and grounded who I am personally, knowing who I am, um, that will help and aid in my um, classroom experience. And also, like you said, my first year, my classroom, that um, that management was, was tough. Like, I'm talking about I had a classroom from hell. And I'm looking <laughs> like, does anybody else have the same problem? And the, the, the veteran's like, oh, they don't do that with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yo, teach me. Give me the secrets. You know, um, and they got cut short because of the pandemic last year, of course. Um, but right before we left, I started to get a little bit of the hang of it. And I took a little bit of peace from this teacher, from that teacher, and started to make something of my own, you know. Um, but also, you know, just being confident in my teaching abilities. Like, they don't hire you for no reason, right? Um, so just knowing that I can do the job. And it took, you know, other black male educators saying, hey, Coop, like, I see you. You need help with this. Let me teach you about this, you know, let me kind of, you know, empower you to believe this, you know, and, and it took them to say, like, I know you can do this and I'm going to help you for me to stay in the classroom, even when I wanted to quit the first year. Right. Yeah. But I'm, you have to understand, I'm, with it. I'm with it. They have to understand education is not cookie cutter, you know. Um, you have different environments, different cities. Um, Catherine and I laughed, she had me laughing, she said, Whitney. I came from New Orleans, and I thought I had the, the hardest, most urban classroom. And I go to D.C., and she like, it's the whole different ball game, you know? You have to understand. It's not to each other. Y'all can have these PDs, and y'all can have these examples, and y'all have um, um, the example on the, on the Promethean board, and it's the perfect students, and everything is working. Yeah, your timeouts, and your ones, and your twos, and threes, your, your clap once, you can hit me on that. Yeah, that's cool on those kids. But once you get into... Um, um, your your northeast DCs and your deep in LJs and your down in the Duval counties and all that that don't work all the time. What I found worked for me though, any day or any time I go to a new school that first day, I swear I'm Joe Clark. I'm Joe Clark. I'm everything. I don't. Have, I have everything except for the back. But I'm Joe Clark because if you do it like that. When it's time to be cool and laugh, you can do that and bring them back together. If you go that soft and scared. You'll never be able to bring them back together. 
You know, yeah. so I'm too far. You think I'm the meanest son of a gun that ever walked the earth that first day. But over the course of the year, you'll find out, oh, we're still waiting to school. We chilling, you know. But you get the temperature in that classroom and let them know, this is my classroom. This is how it's going to go. I don't play no games. And that's how I always have my classroom management, you know, especially dealing with the demographic of kids I deal with. You know, it's always um the worst of the worst. And Catherine, no, JPMI, our first school, that was a school for students that had been adjudicated and had to be um had had to report to school because they were in um juvenile detention. So we had to be Joe Clarks. It had to be hard because those kids they were part of that system already for years. And they're in the high school, but they had been incarcerated for four or five years already. Yeah. So you couldn't play with them, you know. So when you take that into a effect, but once they say that you care about them, you're doing that because it's it's a genuine concern. They're going to respect you, and they're going to have that love for you. They're going to see you on the streets on the weekends like, hey, Mr. Lewis, hey, Mr. Cooper, you know, and I'll have a different conversation, different appreciation, you know, mm -hmm. for, for you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very difficult. It was difficult. <laughs> I thought I would, listen, Cooper, if you ever go up to the older kids, um, I've never taught younger kids. I did have one big one year in middle school, and I told them <laughs> like, but yeah. um, high school students, um, teaching the at risk students, the adjudicating. I thought New Orleans was bad, but DC had a whole different. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't. I was confused. I. I said. I know the crack era is over, but um, these children were sick. Right, and I, and and I looked at them. I had to look at them like because mm -hmm. I'm a doctor. You don't criticize your patients, right? Right. You don't. You don't. Um. You're not hard on your patients, mm -hmm. right? You understand that they're sick, and I had to take on that because these babies were sick, right? These babies were abused. They were violated. They were drug dealers because they had to. Um, yeah. They were murderers and arsonists and rapists because they were put in situations. So I had to look at these babies as if I was the doctor and they were my patient. Right. So that helped me a lot um, when I started looking at babies that were, because I know you might have some um, students that's ED in your class, ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder. Yeah. So you really have to sometimes sit back um, because I got smacked in the face one time. I had to like, I was like, whoa, like, I, I you really have to dig in. That's what people don't understand what we go through as teachers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't understand yeah. that um, I had to restrain the kid. The first time I had to restrain the kid, I literally got in my car and it was in DC. I literally mm -hmm. got in my car and I cried for an hour. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to restrain that kid. I didn't want to yeah. have to put my hands. But that's something that we had to do. Um, no. So um, hopefully you never have to teach in those schools. But uh, um, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those, those, those are the uh, realities, though. Yeah. I've had to restrain kids. I've um, had to become physical with kids. Um, because you never know what the kid is going through at home. I like what Catherine just said. You have to look at them as your patients. You have mm -hmm. to assess them and still be nurturing and try to understand them. Um, I try my hardest to never personally get upset or mad or angry at a kid. Because you never know what they're going through. Once you peel back those layers, you're going to see abuse, neglect, you know, you're going to see um, neglecting forms to where the parent didn't know it was neglect because they didn't know. You understand? So yeah. when I see those those layers, it's it's a multiplicity of things that those kids are going through. And sometimes you have to place yourself in their shoes and see what's going on. You know, um, I carry clothes in my car. Um, I carry deodorant. I carry all types of stuff because the kid may not have. Now, I don't want a kid to not be able to go to class because they're in a uniform violation and the kids say, Mr. Whitney, you don't have a wash machine and it's not wash week. Leave it at the woods. My mama don't have the quarters for the machine. 
All right, I'm going to have a whole bunch of clothes in my car, you know, to provide for that kid. You have to have um, empathy. You have to have mm -hmm. empathy for our kids. You have no idea what they're going through. Mm -hmm. they're, a lot of times these kids are placed in adult predicaments. Mm -hmm. No fault of their own because that's their household. That's what it is, you know. And when you look at it, it's not something that just happened overnight. These are generational deficiencies within that family. So you have to address all of that, you know. When you look back and see, oh, mama didn't finish school, grandma didn't finish school, great grandma didn't finish school, grandpa never went to school. It's like, okay, you don't understand what education is. Right. So I can't yeah. tell the parents to be involved because they don't know. That's so right. okay, mama, all I need you to do is make sure that he's here on time. And if you don't give him breakfast, he's here on time to make breakfast. That's the things I challenge my parents to do because sometimes they just don't have it in them. They don't have to know. You they can't keep up with what you don't know. You can't do it. You know, so I have a great empathy for our people and um, our societal issues that we face as a people. You know, sometimes I have to step back from the road as, as an educator and look back. Okay, how are our people being attacked society? Mm. When I look at that, I'm like, well, all my parents fell victim to that. So now I have to be, I have to be that buffer, okay? Because you fell victim, and I have to be that person that's going to show you this time we get out of this together. Once you do that um, as a unit, then we can uh, resolve a lot of problems within education and within our communities as a whole. You know, because I'm, I'm big on solving community problems. If we solve community problems, we can solve educational problems. We can solve educational problems. We can solve poverty problems. We can solve problems of oppression, and we can, um, we can, um. We can lessen and shorten this um this this uh, wealth gap that we have in America right now, and that all boils down to um empathy and education to me. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what are you doing moving forward? Like, um, what do you see your teaching career? First, let me back up very quickly, and I can touch on this before we move on because. In the math classroom, right, we have to pull so many trinkets out of the head. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not downsizing what you do, boom, and what you do, Mr. Cooper, at science mm -hmm. and, you know, um, elementary schools. I think you teach everything, right, Mr. Cooper? Yes. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. I know. But, um, <laughs> right? but as math teacher, you know, um, we really have to pull the kids out the hat in order to get kids to first. Um, we have to uh, mitigate the fear that they have of math. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we need to get to the content. But what I've learned, um, and through this teacher talk show, I've talked to a phenomenal guy, Dr. Chris Childs, and he mentioned um, we control the um, context. No, let me back up. They control the content, but we control the context. Mm. So it is oh. our job to connect a student. So what happened when you started thinking, like, this is not working, how y'all telling me to do this? I'm about to do this uh, my way. And you went into song, dance, movement. You went into that realm. Mm -hmm. So... What happened? When was your when your light bulb went off? And explain to us what you do, because what you do um, is something that I don't think we're doing maybe a lot in the class. So um, my first year teaching, um, I, I did notice that the students were given curriculum that was way above the level that I, I was given when I was in fifth grade. You know, mm -hmm. and and so. I noticed that a lot of kids came in mathematics not even liking math. They already had a negative depiction of math coming in. So with that being said, I definitely wanted to make sure that I made math fun, made it entertaining. I always try to connect a lesson to something that's in today's time, to something that they can relate to. For example, if I'm talking about plotting on the coordinate plane, I definitely relate it to directions. How do you get to the cone stove right there? You know, somewhere that all of them know. Or, you know, I try to always relate. If we're simplifying numerical expressions, that means you have to follow the rule. I relate to when you're at home, 
what you have to follow rules and if you don't follow what you get so then with this problem i related you know so i always try to bring that connection to mathematics because students do know i mean coming to math immediately like i don't like math that, that's one of the first questions i asked how many of you guys like math hardly any students answer no. that question and then by the end of the school year though i asked that same question today i asked that question every student hand was raised simply because I made them interested in it because I related it to things that they go through every day. And so, for example, I use a lot of music and, and raps and songs and TikToks, um, and I transition them to what they need to know for that particular content. I mean, content. So, um, from Simplifying American Expression, I got follow the rules. Hey, you got to follow the rules. Hey, you follow the So the kids, and I see them when they test it. Oh, wait. E-E-M-B-A. I see it, but I I knew they knew every song on the radio. They could mm -hmm. they could they could tell me every song with the custom words and all that. But yeah. you can't tell me how to multiply. So I was like, you know what, let me make that connection. You know, I can mix some city girls and some multiplication in. Although you know, and and, and I I even when they the songs are played now in the classroom. They not saying the regular lyrics. They're saying the mathematical lyrics. Mm -hmm. So I definitely try to make sure that I, I, I connect to my environment. I, I learn my students, learn what interests them, and build my lesson based off of their interests. And um, a lot of students have connected to math through that way. And I, I've seen a lot of students grow um, mathematically. And I even do a lot of tutoring. When I'm tutoring, I have the opportunity. I may take them outside. Let's go outside. We could have do relays. And I'm a competitive person, so I tell them, I'm going to beat you, too. You know, so mm -hmm. that, that puts a little fire in the students having that comp competition as well. I love a lot of competition in my classroom because that's how life is. You're going to have to compete for a job. You're going to have to compete for this. So, you know, we do a lot of competition in my class, too, and, but that helps drive the lesson. And, and um, that's what makes me stay in education because I know there needs to be a change in the way that students are learning. And so I feel like if I continue to do this and keep making everyone aware of it, some people will start changing theirs and kids will be more interested to want to come to school. Students will be more available to learn. Yeah, I agree. Well, actually, that was the premise in which Kip was started on. Um, Kip was founded by two white boys that was in Teach for America, but they was teaching at a school that had a phenomenal math teacher and she taught mathematical concepts by um, Carter Response methodology. The old African mm -hmm. Carter Response, that's how she taught math. And they took that idea and they found it, okay, this, uh, this is what we do and implement and found this school. So that's how they started, by seeing the teacher doing stuff in an untraditional way, but connected with kids. It was Carter Response. And they wondered how this math teacher is teaching kids how to uh, work with numbers through song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to always think outside of the box to uh, reach your kids. You have to gravitate towards them. Yeah. But in some instances, some instances, the kid has to understand that um, self-discipline and control, you just have to focus and focus in on this discipline and absorb this information and learn it that way. Everything is not always going to be fun and dance, a song mm -hmm. and dance. And some concepts, you just have to learn them. Mm -hmm. and that's what it is. Some things I could give you a song and clap and, and, and have some manipulative, some hands-on things. Some things not. You have to read the comprehend. Once you read the code, you understand, you get it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think they need to have a, have a balance, you know? Some things are going to be fun and hands-on. Some things, no. You have to concentrate yeah. and focus on this, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's 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 balance. Balance. yeah, that balance. That's a balance. That's why I enjoy teaching kids how to be students. And how to get into the pattern. So, you know, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah. But, hey, when it's time to really get down and study for that midterm, sometimes you have to go in that library, like, like, um, I'm going to reference somebody that people don't like anymore. Like, Bill Cosby said to Cosby show them, Theo, leave out that room. Go to the cold library. Get your jacket. Sit in that wooden chair at that wooden table. Focus and concentrate. That's how you learn some things. In other instances, I may be able to make a song or call a response, whatever it may be. But sometimes it's concentration, and you just need to absorb the information for what it is. Have no distractions. It's just you in that book. And go from there. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. But this is 
phenomenal. We, we went over time, but this was a phenomenal hour of power. That's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> I feel like Mrs. T.D. Jakes, you know what yeah. I mean? I'm, like, I'm the first lady to all y'all. <laughs> hey. you know? hey. I, I really appreciate you guys, and I learned so much. Um, and I know that uh, you all are doing what your ancestors has called you to do. Um, you all are doing the calling that was bestowed upon you. And I want you to continue to be great, right? Um, continue to um, make sure that Black men are represented properly, right, inside of the classroom. Because there's a lot of Black men that's not representing the teaching profession properly. Mm -hmm. So um, I commend you all for being the Black men that do um, represent in a positive fashion. And I'm going to leave this one question. <laughs> and, um, uh, and and people are saying a uh, great uh, conversation. Hey, all, to all three brothers for educating our kids. Um, but my last question is yes or no, all right? Five years, do you plan on being um, in the teaching profession? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Boom, you're like, um. Nah, because <laughs> like I said, I don't have to. I don't have to be at a school or in a classroom. Right. I'm a. I'm a natural teacher. Really, regardless of where I'm at, I'm always trying to teach somebody something because I'm a natural learner. I want to learn something new every day. So this opportunity tonight, I learned from Mr. Cooper and Mr. L and Mr. Lewis and from you, Cat. Yeah. So I'm always going to be teaching. I could be in a schoolhouse or. In the middle of a park. I'm always going to be teaching. Yeah. So make sure you guys, before you leave, you drop your handles. I kind of, I pretty much put everybody's handle um, up here. But if you have, like, I have a math tutoring company for all those people who are visiting and don't know me, um, I'm going to drop that handle. So take the time out, you guys, to, uh, you know, drop your handles just so people can know where yeah, to know where and that's about it. Do y'all have any questions for me? But this was awesome. No, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Yes. I appreciate it. Um, you took me away from a vacation, but I'm always willing to put in work. You know, and I'm about to go party after this. But I look forward to um, having more conversations like this and during your show. Um, you know I'm not on Instagram too much. I'm on Facebook. I can't do too many social medias. But um, I have you pegged in now. I look forward to having these conversations with other educators and learning from them as well. I appreciate you. Thank you, brother. Thank you Thank so you. much. I, I really enjoy myself. I was, I'm very humbled to have been a part of this. I think that we need more transparent conversations like this. I need, I think that we need to involve the parents, you know, as well, just, just more trans, transparent conversations to really go in depth in what is the problem with education and how can we fix it? So I thank you for this teacher talk show because it's definitely going to help some people. And I hope it motivates some more men to come out and get an education because brothers, we need you. You know, I, I, I little brothers need you, you know? Yeah. So thank you so much for this. Thank yeah. you. Thank Lewis. you. Thank you for Mr. Lewis for reaching, you know, accepting my invitation. I was like, <laughs> I don't want you to think I'm a stalker, no. but I watch me. <laughs> I interrupted you. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. I was just saying thank you. Echo, echo one of the thoughts of these brothers right here. Um, just blessed to be in a space where I can share about what I do um, and be inspired by what these brothers do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm, I'm inspired today to keep going. Like, y'all got years in the game, and I'm just thinking about the number of lives that I can impact over the, the course of the years that I'm in education. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, to be in the company of you guys, veteran teacher. Uh, thank you for the words. Definitely going to put them into practice today. And I appreciate you, appreciate you guys, guys so much. But um, keep wearing the crown. Make sure that uh, you continue to push this identity into these babies and you continue to build and look the part. Um, I know Boom is the bow tie guy. Um, uh, and, you know, <laughs> and, and look, and you see my hand and everybody's room for boom. Um, 
In a couple of weeks, I got another announcement that I'm going to be making too, Catherine. So be looking out for that too. I'm trying to still affect change to education through um, politics. And um, yeah, I'm about to put my hat in something else right now. You know, I, I ran for school board last year and I, um, I missed the runoff race by 100 votes, you know, because I'm trying to affect change any way I know how. But um, right now, something else is brewing so that everybody vote for Boom, that's still going to be effective in the next few weeks to come too. So keep an eye out for that, okay? Yes, yes, and I and I'm always here to support you guys, and I also have a great network. And last thing, but um, not least, uh, Mr. Cooper and everybody that's on here, um, people say don't intertwine with your coworkers. That is false. Let me tell you, I have built relationships with great, smart, educated black men and um, within uh, I call it the African diaspora education, mm -hmm. and we form our black congregation at the job and it's well respected everybody can't be in the camp but make sure you have people in your circle at your job that you can trust and and y'all thug it out together yeah you know so that was that's extremely important because if i'm missing my network of brothers and sisters uh i don't know where i would be so thank you all and I appreciate you. And I will be looking out and I'm going to post the videos. So look out for that too. And I'm going to tag you. So thank you so much. No and problem. I'll thank, you. Next time. thank you. Thank you. Well well have a great <laughs> Are you too. Enjoy the rest of y'all school year because I mean, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been through, baby. <laughs> I got two more weeks. <laughs>